Thank you. I'm Wes Clary. I'm a PhD student at the University of New Mexico. I'd also like to thank my co-authors who are listed below here. Today I'm going to be talking about geographically weighted regression. We've developed a modified approach where we subsample the data and perform GWR in a Monte Carlo style. And then I'm going to discuss an application to channel morphology in the Gulf of Alaska. The geographically weighted regression technique is a method where each feature is fitted with a local multivariable linear regression. Um, it's a quantitative method to rank the importance of competing parameters. The Esri info page provides an example of crime as a function of population and income. <clears throat> and as the crime function varies spatially, the coefficients beta 1 and beta 2 change. This is a non-stationary relationship. Um, the local relationship of crime with population is revealed by the relative coefficients. And you can see this in our illustration here. A common problem in multivariable regression is collinearity. So in the ideal case that we see here, the, a different fit plane has a large impact in the R squared. In that case, the coefficients are well determined. We can't really move that plane around much. If we look at case B, the case of high collinearity, what we see is there's a range of planes that we could fit in there, and our coefficients are poorly determined. Um, we could have a case of moderate collinearity, where we have sort of a small range of planes that might fit in there, and we could have a case where um, not all of the coefficient determinations are affected by collinearity. So if you look at the slope um, on x2 right there, it's pretty constant no matter which plane you fit in there. Our approach subsamples the data and performs GWR in a Monte Carlo style. This reduces some of the errors associated with collinearity and allows us to interpret coefficient distributions through multiple runs. So by combining techniques of leave some out and Monte Carlo, and doing it many times, we're able to think of these subsets as new data. And this varies the kernel and smooths the effects of collinearity. This produces a distribution of coefficients that we can evaluate um, how our model performed. You can imagine this as sort of with each subset, we might get new potential data, and we might leave some data out. As we do more and more iterations, we can make predictions about the coefficients in each of these cases. In the ideal case, our coefficients are all about the same through each Monte Carlo run. Um, in the case of high collinearity, what we're going to see is coefficients which are highly variable and have a large standard deviation. We want to reject this data. We don't want to include this in our analysis. But we might have the case of moderate collinearity where our coefficients have a well-defined mean value. It might be normally distributed, or the coefficients are stable. We can use our predictions to develop a statistical filter that allows us to trust our data more and hopefully eliminate some of the collinearity. Our specific application is in the Gulf of Alaska, where we're trying to predict the channel shape index, which is what it looks like in cross-section. Is it more U-shaped or is it more V-shaped? We selected four parameters based on a principal component analysis, which I don't have time to discuss today. But we selected faults, instability, and two different ice sheet extents as a way of predicting the shape index. What we did was make 200 subsets of the data. So we did 200 Monte Carlo runs. We created these subsets. We performed the GWR on each subset. And then we applied selection criteria. So we wanted the R squared to be decent. We wanted the condition value to be not in error. And we wanted the intercept to be positive, which is required from the type of data we need. Um, we then took those distributions, because we did this 200 times. At each location, we got coefficients from multiple runs. And we put those distributions into our statistical filter, which allowed us to then rank these globally and locally. Um, these are what our tests look like. What you see here is our first test is for normality. If these coefficients were relatively well distributed, they might be normal here. We use the KS test. Um, the bottom is a synthetic normal distribution we're testing against. We also wanted the data to have a small standard deviation at each location. That would mean that it was relatively constant, like we showed in our predictions. And then our third test here is if we had a majority bin. If most of the coefficients sort of fell in one bar here, then we feel like we could trust it. It was pretty constant. It might be like that well-determined case. 
And then finally, if, it accept, if, it, if the distribution's passed any of these tests, then we're going to call that data pretty trustworthy. This allows us to ask questions like, does blank process result in U or V-shaped drainage cross-sections? We saw with the two ice sheet extents, the MGL and the LGM, that these things had a negative relationship. So that meant that as we're close to the ice sheets, we're seeing more U-shaped cross profiles in our channels. We can also look at the magnitudes, um, but what we really want to do is look at the map, right? So we've plotted the pie diagram here where we were able to rank each coefficient, and the orange is instability, the red here is false, and so depending on which has a bigger slice, we can attribute an effect on the shape index of the channels to that process. So we see some clustering here, um, and this is pretty much what we use as our interpretation. We have some areas where the instability is the main contributor, and we have some areas where faults better explain the variation in shape index. And that's what I've got for you today. Thank you.